All right. This is the Calvinist Boo Crew, and I'm J.C. Bear. I'm here with great people, and we are in awe of today's reading text. There are a few texts that exemplify the Christian faith, more so than Psalm 23. This is one of the, the fundamental psalms. Look, all of the Bible is inspired, but in terms of mind share, in terms of psalms that have shaped the culture and are very much still, even to this day, a part of the Christian ethos. Psalm 23 looms large. It's one of the psalms that, that young people still learn when they come become new to the faith, and it's one of the psalms that old-timers and wizened, mature people in the faith go to. So it is a central text, and I've got the Bradster here. Darcy is with us as well, and our good friend, Drew Out. And i got to tell you, I need every single one of these brothers to help me with this wonderful and amazing text. Bradster, Psalm 23. In some ways, it doesn't get any bigger than this in terms of importance. What comes to your mind thinking about the chapter, and what role has it played in your life? Endless. It's, it's amazing. It's so deep. It's so profound. Everything in it is so beautiful that quite often I find that everything in it gets overlooked and not even thought of or thought through there. And that's a big disappointment because it's so clear that this section teaches how God is our God. And how are you doing today? I, yesterday was your birthday. Happy birthday, J.C. Bear. Thank you, my friend. I am doing well. Grateful in the Lord. So thankful. I've had a chance to really enjoy some time in the scriptures recently, as well as some theology books that I've been reading. So this has been just an exceptionally blessed time for me. And thank you very much, my friend, for remembering me. Now, Darcy, speaking of remembering, Psalm 23 opens with the clause that is probably the defining characteristic of what people think of Christians from old to young and everywhere in between. The Lord is my shepherd. Darcy, what do you think about that? And what's your idea in terms of the Psalms role that it plays in your life, the impact that it's had in the culture and, and where it ought to be? Well, Jesus did say he was, or he is the good shepherd. We really should, you know, dive more into the agrarian context of this because it just makes it so much, so much richer, especially when you consider what, you know, what its author, David, went through during his life. And just the statement, the Lord is my shepherd, I mean, he leads, he guides, he takes care of us. and. If people believe that more consistently, and I'm saying this to myself, not pointing fingers at anyone else more generally, and I'm saying this as much to myself as to anyone, if people believe this more consistently, we'd see at least a reduction in the amount of anxiety issues that have really been plaguing, you know, plaguing the society, Western society in particular. But yeah, it's something, Psalm 23 is something that people know. Some people can recite it by heart. The question is one more of internalization. Amen, brother. Amen. You're out. I'm humbled at the foot of this psalm, and I'm sure you are too. It is so crucial to a healthy and wholesome understanding of how a believer relates to God. Brother, what's it like? How, how did this psalm come to you, and, and how has it impacted you through the years? It's, it's a beautiful psalm, and, you know, what we're witnessing in this psalm is a revelation of God's faithfulness to us as believers. And no matter what happens, and at the same time, this psalm uh, comes through the life experience of King David, who experiences the faithfulness of God throughout his life and understands them from the Word of God. And the Spirit uses David to write this, to teach us the infallibility of his faithfulness towards us, no matter what comes. And we could 
Say it in one short phrase. God, Lord Jesus Christ, he is our all and in all. And when we look at that faithfulness of God, we see what God caused in David's life and brought forth fruit, that that fruit was written down, inspired by the Holy Spirit, using the abilities and experiences that David had to communicate to us that loving faithfulness of God. Bradster, I'm going to open this discussion session by just saying a little bit of a backstory here. Now, so first of all, Psalm 23 in the King James. Bradster, you and I have spoken often about our desire to have the language of the Bible in an English translation that is very easy and readable for us. And so because of that, sometimes we use other reputable translations and don't focus, for example, only on the King James Version. But if there was any one text that could convince me to be a King James only person, it is the beautiful poetry of this psalm. And I'm just going to I'm going to read it in the King James, and then we're going to reread it again uh, with one of the other translations and talk about it together. But the point is not to get sectarian and go to war over the translations, but the point is Psalm 23 in this English version in the King James is perhaps the single most memorized text in the English-speaking world for the last 400 years. And it goes like this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Now, actually, let me start that again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, Bradster, I am a fan of the other translations for readability's sake. But Bradster, something about Psalm 23 really draws me back to my youth when it was only talked about in this King James Version. Has it been something like that for you in your life? And if so, how do you feel about the importance of this text using that particular translation? As an unbeliever, I heard the King James rendering of this quite a bit. My parents or parent was into the fundamental Baptist movement, and this would require a King James Bible. <laughs> and this is the particular text, this and maybe John 3.16, perhaps. And it always sounded beautiful to me. So I'm even as an unbeliever, you can't deny its beauty. Now, in the faith, I appreciate it even more. I love the King James Bible. The King James Bible is a wonderful translation, and it is extremely hard to read. It's like learning two languages at once, just to capture the English in it. But not so much here, which our brother pointed out perfectly. Perfectly, We know that it's a translation of the Bible that, well, it's just that, a good, faithful translation of the Bible. And it has its limits where it has its limits, and it's usually to do with the manuscript that were available at the time, or it's usually to do with how hard and difficult it is to read. But one thing by all people everywhere, I would say, would come to admit that this translation is beautiful. It's such a beautiful way to read the Bible. He maketh me, he leadeth me. I I, I don't think that we're beyond comprehension of what he's saying here. I, I really, I just, I give you all and every that listens to this a little bit more credit than this. I would say that everyone knows exactly what it's saying and everyone is ex- enjoying it. I, I guarantee it. I, I didn't frown on these verses even as an unbeliever. I was just more about myself than I was about discovering who the real God of the universe was. But as we all know, 
He's the one that leads us. He's the one that makes us anew. And he's the one who did this aforetime before anything has ever happened. He chose to do these things. And the results are very clear. And that is what we're reading in this particular psalm. Now, Darcy, I know you have a translator's heart. And so I know language is meaningful to you. And so I want to ask about that. But I also want to throw in this additional idea. And it's this. Psalm 23 is not only known for the text of the King James Version of it, but Darcy, there's also very oftentimes in the cultural ethos an association of this psalm with, well, for lack of a better word, funerals. And so if you look at where people in the last 50 years, perhaps, have tended to hear this psalm in a generic or typical sense or setting, well, it's very often associated with a funeral. And so I've even had people say, when you start to read this, oh, don't read that. Don't read that psalm. It reminds me of when grandma died. It reminds me they said that at her funeral, and it brings back all these negative memories. Darcy, what's your thoughts about that? And, and what would you say to somebody who just wants this psalm to be a funerary piece? I'd say that's very unfortunate, especially if it comes out of the mouth of a professing Christian, because really, I suppose it started, honestly enough, as someone's go-to verse going through life, because, come on, you've got going through the valley of the shadow of death, through the darkest parts of one's life absolutely possible, realizing the presence of God there, whether they do end up passing or not, it is a statement of utmost faith. And I just think, like, the whole concept of it being relegated to a funerary piece is both new and somewhat heartbreaking to me, because it's a great life psalm. It's, it's, it's an expression of deep faith, and it's talking about all the days of my life in the last verse. How could you relegate something like that to simply being spoken in funerals? Now, Drew Out, Darcy's really brought up something crucial here. There are principles that are packed into this psalm that are, they're both simple enough that you don't have to be a professional to, to know the phrases and clauses in this psalm. Bradster said that earlier. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You know, these are simple sentences, even in the archaic King James. And yet, Drew out, there is a depth to the theology here that is staggering. What comes into your mind when you think about how God has packed these few verses with so much meaning? Oh, yeah, I, I totally just love what Brother Darcy had to say about this in the frame of how this actually should be used. And these, in essence, we should look at them as the promises of God, because it is what God is doing. It is what he does for us as believers. It's not all sunshiny days, but it's days where the sun shines. And this is the beautiful aspect of knowing the faithfulness of God. And I don't know how how else could actually phrase it other than it's just like a great, it's just like all the promises of God are yes, yes. And David has experienced this, and this comes out as the Spirit moves him. And it's such a joyous psalm. It's not meant for a funeral. It's meant for life. It's meant to stabilize stabilize us as believers in seeing the transcendent beauty of the Lord. Bradster, verse 1 is really the anchor point here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Bradster, how can so much, how can, how can a promise of such great importance be specified in these few words? Yeah, I lack nothing, and it's all because of God, because this is revealed to me. This is shown to me, and the proof of that is I focus on Jesus. And by 
that focus that he has brought forth to me. I live for him. I don't live for myself. So there's a lot more going on than just what he did for me. It's how he's using me throughout the course of my life, how he is establishing me and maintaining me. And therefore, the fruit comes. I would use this verse in that such of a context to prove that sort of doctrine, like a sanctification thought, you know, early on, a obvious persever- perseverance of the saints thought, an obvious irresistible grace thought, and I dare even say unconditional election thought. I dare say that this thought is exactly why all of us should be reformed, because the Lord is our shepherd. He chose to be our shepherd. He is. He claimed us by name, John 10. He knows us all, and we come in and we go out. Because of him, we shall lack nothing. Because of his grace, because of his mercy. Now, does that involve me doing something? Absolutely. And that's the fulfillment of what the will of God is bringing forth in my life. I will lack nothing. Even though times are hard, even though times are troubling, as we continue on to read, I lack nothing because the Lord is my shepherd. He has made himself known to me. Darcy, let's build on what the Bradster started off so well here. We have the statement, the Lord is my shepherd. And I think one of the first things that comes to the mind here is this idea, this protectorate, this suzerainty, this this relationship between one who is taking care of and, and the one who is being being taken care of. And we have statements elsewhere in the scriptures that really reinforce this. For example, Isaiah 40, verse 11. Mm-hmm. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads the nursing ewes. John 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Ezekiel 34, 11, for this is what the Lord God says, behold, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. And so Darcy, we have this, we have in this very small package of words, this crucial relationship between God and man, between creator and the creature. What does that mean to you? And what happened in your mind when it all clicked, became real and made sense? And let me tell you, as someone who's on the spectrum, it took a little time for this to click completely. But when it finally did, you realize that basically when you're a sheep, obviously the Lord is one's shepherd. You're being compared to a sheep. And that shepherd is so much to you all at once. He he leads you, he directs you, he provides, he protects. Sometimes he even disciplines and will undoubtedly come back to that you know, a little later in this psalm. And it's just very rich. It speaks about God's sovereign care over his people. And to hear that come out of the mouth of someone like David, sure, he has that agrarian background. He was often out in the fields with the sheep. Where was he when Samuel came looking for him? But he's also this great, this great king in the history of in the history of Israel. And to hear him portray himself as being someone as lowly as a sheep under a shepherd is just a sign of faith and really surrender to God's will. Throughout, there's a clause that follows what we just said. So, the Lord is my shepherd, and immediately after that, I shall not want. Drew out, that seems pretty important and relevant. Would you build on what you think the text is trying to talk about with respect to God's provision for his people? Well, it, it's a beautiful thing because here we're seeing something that's indicative of the change 
of nature. The nature is different here. We know that David is born again, and he understands the Word of God. And also with his nature, this want also would refer to not being idolatrous, right? Because he provides all things according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when we're looking at this, the Lord is keeping him as well in his life. And this is, this is as you go on through this psalm, you will see that's what he's actually writing about. He's writing this song. And this song, or psalm, if you will, can you imagine having your guitar, playing this psalm, and meditating on the Lord and the goodness of God that keeps you and leads you to repentance the rest of your life until he receives you up in glory? This is a beautiful psalm, once again, of the Lord's faithfulness. And, you know, going going right back to what it is, you shall not want. you you. Uh, he will keep you in his by his grace, let's say, as the word says, because it is by grace you have been saved. That faith that he's given you, that it's not of yourself, so that we have no boasting for all such boasting in anything in and of ourselves would be sin. And we see that God causes this through the new creative act in one being born again. And so we see this relationship that King David has, and God made him a king on top of that from being a shepherd boy. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. You notice, as you would go back and read the text through the Old Testament, the children of Israel got a king after their own heart, but then it wasn't long after that God would install a king after his own heart. Now, Bradster, the psalm builds, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then verse 2 says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And I think some ideas that come out of here is there's a reason that we're not going to lack. And that is because he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. <laughs> he leadeth me beside the still waters. Other verses put it this way. Revelation 7, 17 says this, For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. Then Psalm 36, verse 8 says, They feast on the abundance of your house, and you will give them drink from your river of delights. Isaiah 49, verse 10 says this, They will not hunger or thirst, nor will scorching heat or sun beat down on them. For he who has compassion on them, will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. And then Ezekiel 34, 14 says this, I will feed them in good pasture, and the lofty mountains of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in a good grazing land. They will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. Bradster, it sounds, it sounds like God has a plan for this blessing. What comes to your mind hearing verses like these? Well, it reminds me of the publican and the Pharisee. It reminds me that there are two different attitudes with temporal satisfaction. Either you know it's from God or you don't know it's from God. Well, even this, that you treat it like it's from God or you treat it like it's just another one of those things over there. Ugh. You know, so there, there's two attitudes, and we know the attitude one shines onto the attitude everlasting because that leads us to the beatific vision. That leads us to seeing him made fully known to us that we get to be with the Lord our God who is our light and exist in his light forever, exist in his fullness and not lack anything forever. We're already seated in heavenly places. Or we have the attitude, this sucks. Everything's bad. So much for a bad attitude, right, guys? But we go through those seasons. We have those days. But this is the thing. Habitually speaking, what is the thought in the mind of a Christian? It's on a common demeanor. It's, it's a form of thankfulness towards the maker that others do not share in, at least to the true maker. So... 
guess what? They're going to lack this thankfulness. They're, they're going to have this dissatisfied taste towards the maker. They're going to suppress the truth in unrighteousness as they were destined to do. And it's such a shame. I hate to hear that. And that is why we should push forward, just like Paul did in Romans 9. We should always push forward to bring as many with us as possible should be the attitude of the heart, to be used by the Lord our God in every way that he chooses for us to be used that he gives us to be used with. Darcy, Bradster really brings up a good point here. And right as he was talking about this idea of a grateful attitude, I was just looking at Psalm 511, which says this, you crown the year with your bounty and your paths overflow with plenty. And Darcy, I don't take the text to mean this situation in an absurd sense. How are you doing today? Oh, everything's perfect. Everything's great. Everything could never, couldn't be any possibly better. I'm not trying to say that the text is giving us that cartoonish of a picture of the delights of being in God's world. But Darcy, he's not called the Prince of Peace for nothing, is he? No, he most certainly is not. I I remember um, a time in my life where I was going through a very serious illness, and God absolutely provided me with his peace. Sure, I did have a stretch there where I was down, sounding very Eeyore and doom and gloom, but that passed, and just what God brought into my life in in that period was this very strong sense of peace. There's really something special here. Darcy just said it. He leads me beside quiet waters. Drew out in your thinking, what does this tie into this idea of quiet waters, of peaceful streams? How, how does that fit in terms of the painting that the psalm is trying to, to paint to us? Yeah, that, that really shows that David here, as he trusts, as he has this trust in the Lord, that he has the peace of God that passes all understanding. Because we'll see later in the psalm where he talks about various things that he goes through. And he says, he leads me by quiet waters. And we as believers, not that we don't have our times of fretting, but there's something that happens in the midst of it, where the Lord leads us into the peace of God that passes all understanding. The world can never know that. They, it's something that comes straight from God himself, being one of his own, being one of his sheep. And, you know, it's interesting that he's using shepherd language because the analogy here is being one of his sheep. And if anybody would know that sheep can be easily disturbed and thrown off to one side or the other very easily, but he's painting the picture of his rest in the Lord as he feeds on his faithfulness, which is just so beautiful that we have all this in the New Testament scriptures that speak of this as well, and how we should stand on those promises of God and feed on his faithfulness. Bradster, the next verse starts off and says this, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, Bradster, there's a lot here, and, and feel free to comment on any portion of this. But I think one of the things that strikes me is not a lot of non-Calvinists expect to find determinism in Psalm 23. And yet, that's what we have here, isn't it, brother? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God is calling the shots. God is laying the path. God is making it all happen. We just, you, you and I were on an episode where we just talked about Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and I think it was, let me pull it up here. Yeah, it was Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 10. Everything has already been decided. It was known long ago what each person would be. So there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. Bradster, he leadeth 
direct me in the paths of righteousness. What does that say to you? I'm going to leave some room for the brothers on this with some of these words, because J.C. Bear pointed out these are very deep and profound words. But I'm going to take the notion of total depravity in light of he restores my soul. For this reason, we have a lot of good answers with our Reformed doctrine. But I would ask the non-Reformed, hey, what is the answer to him restoring your soul? Why does he have to restore your soul? Why? Can you give me a direct answer? Can you tell me that you are corrupt, that you are spiritually dead, that you are of sin, that you have a sin nature, without giving me some gibberish, telling me that you're also born innocent? How does being born innocent and being born with corruption, how does that go together? Isn't that an oxymoron? Isn't that the opposite of wisdom? Isn't that the opposite of what is being revealed here? It is so clear in every chapter, especially Psalm 20, that we are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. Not we're sick and in need of a doctor, but we are dead and in need of life. And he is the life-giving spirit. He's not the life-offering spirit, friends. Yes, does he offer it to everyone? Well, he sends us out to offer it to everyone, but he makes his home. We don't make our home. He makes his home inside of us. He unites us to himself. All for, well, you know what? I'm going to give the rest of Darcy. And with that, my brothers, I must be out for the day. It's been a pleasure. I love you, J.C. Bear. I love you, Darcy. And throughout, I'll talk to you soon. God bless all of you. And may God do a wonder in your life's listeners. God bless you. Now, Darcy, we, we've really, we've been, the, the baton has been passed. He leads <laughs> me in paths of righteousness. And so here's some other verses, Darcy. Psalm 5, verse 8 says this, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Psalm 25, verse 9, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Psalm 31, verse 3 says, For you are my rock and my fortress. Lead me and guide me for the sake of your name. Psalm 85, verse 13. Righteousness will go before him to prepare the way for his step. Psalm 109, verse 21. But you, O God, the Lord, deal kindly with me for the sake of your name. Deliver me by the goodness of your loving devotion. And finally, Psalm 139, verse 10, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Now, Darcy, I'm not trying to quote unquote sell determinism, but at the same point in time, there's some kind of determinism in this text. Otherwise, mm -hmm. why should we believe his promises? Well, yeah, just the fact that it says, he leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. That's the CSB reading of it. But it's the same thing. You've got this determinism. At the very least, it's compatibilism. And since the end goal is his glory, he is not going to not gonna let you out of that leadership. He, I'm not sure how to or how one would word this as a you know, compatibilist. Maybe, you, or just a sec, I gotta get my train of thought back here. If someone is leading you, you may have a little um, room to kind of explore, explore within a certain range. Say you're on, you're in this fenced field, and you're driving around on a, you know, driving around on a quad, you could go within the boundaries of this fenced field, no problem. But if you try to, say, go through the fence and for the purpose of exploring outside, you're going to wreck the quad and hurt yourself. How much more than when you're being shepherded by the Lord? And again, I mentioned earlier that the discipline of God is part of the sovereignty of God, and it does come through in this psalm. In fact, in the next verse. But yeah, definitely the 
ultimate sovereignty of God over, you know, the paths that his people take. There's something there that's special in that verse. He leads me for, now here's the clause, for his name's sake. You're out. What's that about? What's the psalmist trying to communicate with that phrase? Well, I could shorten it up to the glory of God alone. God is doing a work, and when he does a work in his people, he does it for his glory, and in his glory leading his people, he does all good things, right? All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, he, according to his purpose, the called are caused in glorifying God for his name's sake. I think it's that simple, and it's that beautiful work of God that works in these weak, this weak flesh that we have. And it's wonderful to see the strength of God in our weakness. And we can only know that strength. As Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because why? Because God is magnified. God is glorified. The flesh is nothing. It's what the Spirit does in and through us that glorifies God. And we can have that true worship of God in glorifying God, not through, the, not through this weak flesh, but seeing that God works through this weak flesh. And it's, a, it's just so beautiful. The things of God are mysterious at some times, but we recognize it. We see the hand of God in our life. We see him guiding us. We see him getting, getting us through things for his good purpose, and his purposes are always good. And when we think about Romans chapter 8, what does Paul say? Paul says, look, Christ died for you. He says, not only that, but election, calling, glorification, everything is tied into the atonement. And what God has atoned for is all glory to God because God has atoned for his people and he has a purpose for his people, not only in this life, but also for the next. Now, I think we've lost Bradster, but we've gained a cat. Cat, are you here? Are you with us, sister? Yes, I am. Well, you came at the perfect time, and we need your help, sister. We are reading together Psalm 23, and let me ask you about verse 4. It says this in the King James, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Sister, what do you think about the staggering implication of what this verse is trying to tell us? Hmm. Well, I know that, that no matter what we face or what evil or what surrounds us, that God is always and he's always leading us. So we don't have to feel like we're alone, even in this, you know, evil world that we're living in. If we are his, then we have nothing to fear. So he gives us that peace that we long for. And that that's very special peace that, that only he can give. Darcy, Psalm 27, verse 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? How does that fit in with, with this idea? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How does that idea fit in, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? It speaks to the idea that when we're with God, when he is with us, we really do not have anything to fear. We could be staring death in the face. We could be about to be killed for our beliefs. We really do not have anything to be afraid of. And it's something that I personally have to repeat to myself a lot because I have a tendency to overthink things. And overthinking often leads to, well, or sometimes I should say, leads to anxiety. But I really don't have a reason to be anxious, even in really bad situations. Thank you, God. Now, Drew out. Psalm 
chapter 16, verse 8 says this, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. How does that tie in in your thinking with this? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And we can see that once again, this is the confidence instilled by God through his word and his pre- great and precious promises. I'm pretty sure David knew that scripture is God a man that he should lie was in his mind as well. No, the great and precious promises of God always carried him through. He was Christ dependent always. He had this calm from his faith through the work of the Lord that proved out through his life. And it seems, you know, from the very beginning as a young boy, he faced off with Goliath. It was Christ in him that slayed the giant. And it's the same thing that goes on in through our lives. When the wicked come across, we have nothing to fear because we are already victorious in Christ. We know and we understand those great and precious promises. You know, it's this verse is a popular verse. He who began a good work in you, Paul says, I'm confident for that very thing, is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man. And King David knew that. He was very well aware, and he could write this and enjoy it, and this would be passed on because God was speaking, working in him and through him to speak to us as well. So we can take joy. And one of these days, I know there's probably been some songs written about it, but written about it or written of the psalm, and I know there has actually. I've heard them, but I don't think the mu- accompaniment of music has actually done it justice. I think there needs to be a more joyous melody to this song, accompaniment, excuse me, to the psalm, because when we look at it, it is a joyous thing, because in it we see the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's beautiful to think about, that there's going to be some musical setting that conveys the beautiful peace of these lyrics. Now, Kat, you and I are a bit partial to our our hymns and music. When you read psalms like this, this famous Psalm 23, are there any songs that stir up in your heart? And if so, Mm. which one and why? Hmm. I was thinking about this song, It Is Well With My Soul. I don't know why, but I I guess because this song gives you peace. And, you know, it says, when peace like a river. But I I just feel like this psalm, I know it's it's usually read at funerals, but it's because it gives peace. And God always promises he's going to give us peace. And, you know, whenever, whenever there's mourning, he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. It doesn't say they may be comforted or they might be. He says they shall be. So that's, I guess that's why they read this, but it gives you a peace. And that song is talking about peace like a river and it is well with my soul. And whenever you say it is well with my soul, that is the peace that God gives you when, you know, whenever you're his You have nothing to worry about when you're walking the valley, the shadow of death, because it's appointed that everyone must die. And after that, the judgment. So we it it calls us to check in ourselves and know that we are ready and we are his and we have nothing to fear when we belong to the, the master. I don't know. That song just came to mind. There's another song, but I just can't think at the moment. But I just, you know, love the the peace that it gives to us and another song maybe i just thought of one there was peace in the valley for me someday there will be peace in the valley for me that's a really beautiful song so i i don't know i just think of peace when i think of that song amen sister those are beautiful beautiful Mm. tunes i love those darcy this next verse is an interesting one and i've heard some people say that it seems 
incongruous with the rest of the psalm. It somehow seems a little bit out of place with the rest of the verse. Now, having said that, maybe it's not. Let's read this verse together, you and I, and then I want your opinion on, on what you think, what role this verse is playing. And that is verse 5. It says this, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Darcy, how does this all tie in? And, and now all of a sudden we're talking about enemies. What's, what's going on here? I've heard a couple of interpretations of this. One of them actually has more of an agrarian slant to it. How table in this context is referring to what geographers would call a mesa or a butte, something or a part of land that's high up with a flat top. But at the same time, if you think about it more in the sense of oh he's preparing this big feast in front of the enemies and that kind of makes more sense given the my cup overflows that does still tie in because it's talking about how god he provides for our needs including food and drink including you know including being cleaned oftentimes uh, anointing with oil obviously you would immediately think of being appointed as a king or something like that but often anointing oil in those days had a more general use and that was for you know it was almost like being cleaned so it's again speaking to God's care for um, his people. And the whole thing about the cup overflowing, obviously, is how it'll go above and beyond what even what one would expect. Amen. Amen. Drew out, that's a, a beautiful explanation from our brother. And I think a verse or two that comes in my mind to relate to this, I think of Psalm chapter 16, verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. And then Psalm 31, 19 says this, How great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have bestowed before the sons of men on those who take refuge in you. Psalm 92, verse 10 says, But you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. With fine oil I have been anointed. Throughout, there's something special happening here. And it, it, has to do, it has to do with the nature of God's provision towards his people. And it is, it is a good heritage, is it not? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we look at what God does, and it's absolutely what we would say deterministic in what he does. Notice, I believe the very first one, Psalm 16, 5, it's basically the Lord is my chosen purpose, right? If I'm quoting it correctly again, if I'm rem remembering correctly. Well, portion. Yeah, portion, yes. The Lord is my cho chosen portion. The Lord chose us and when he chose us it's his portion that he gave to us he gave himself to us not only to us but for us and we see this that also it ties in to the definite atonement the lord is my portion he is my righteousness he is all these things he causes me to trust him in him all these he brought peace through the blood of his cross, all these things we are partakers of. Remember in John 6, he said, unless you drink of, my, drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no life in you. Yes, the atonement is central. The Lord is my portion because he gave himself for me. And we can have all the great and precious promises tied in with that atonement after all. Who will separate you from the love of Christ, correct? Yes, the Lord is my portion. He's the one who sets me up. He is the one who sets us up to prosper. And not as the way of the world 
looks at or the way the world looks at is prosperous, but actually what is truly prosperous, the prosperity that can truly only come from God. Now, Cat, in verse 5, it ends with three of the most beautiful words I think I've ever heard. My cup overflows. Now, it is four in the King James. <laughs> My cup runneth over. But sister, sister, what does, when you hear those words, what, what's coming into your heart and what's coming into your soul about the nature of God's provision for you? I don't know. It just, when my cup runneth over, I just feel like the joy of the Lord is just abundant inside of you and then flowing from inside your heart. And, and it's just full when your cup is full, you're just, you're just full with joy and happiness and praise for the Lord. And I don't know, he's, he's just blessed us so much that I don't know how we could not feel the joy and the joy of the Lord is my strength. And when your cup is overflowing, I guess you've got a lot of strength there. I just want to praise and thank him for all he does for me and all he's done for the Boo Crew. And I was so blessed just to get on here with you guys today. And I'm just so thankful and so happy that we still have this Boo Crew and a chance to honor and praise our Lord because of all he's done for us. And we want to honor and thank and praise him. And our cup is running over with, you know, all the blessings and everything that he's given us. He, he's made abundance of joy in our heart. And even when we don't have a lot in our life, we have abundance of joy with him and in, in him and through him and with his Holy Spirit inside of us to guide us to, to the truth of, of everything and the eternity that we'll spend with him. And it's just so, you know, joyous because he's he's an amazing God and he's he just fills your heart with wonder and joy as you as you just go through each day and you're amazed with all the things he's working on and doing. And I just praise him for all the things he does, all the things he's doing, all the things he's going to do, and and for for the heavens that he's prepared for those that love him. And and I've just, you know, honor and praise him so much and thank him. Darcy, Psalm twenty five ten says this all the Lord's ways are loving and faithful to those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Psalm twenty seven verse four says this, one thing I have asked of the Lord. This is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Now, Darcy, that, that dovetails with this last verse in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, Darcy, there's a promise here. It will come to pass. But Darcy, what are we to make of the one giving the promise? What are we to make of the one giving the promise? Well, for one thing, that he's good, that he cares about every aspect of our lives, that, but also that he has a desire to see us made more and more holy, which came out in those um, those other t other psalms that you quoted. He he wants the best for us. It's the best way to sum things up. And what is best for us is to walk in His ways. And actually, as I'm as I'm speaking and listening here. I'm also working through Jude in the language that I'm working on. And this comes up in or this comes up in Jude for things the writer is exhorting his audience to do, that we should walk in God's ways. And ultimately, those will lead to us living our best life. Not in the Joel Osteen sense, obviously, but in the truest sense of things. Drew out, the psalmist in Psalm 61, verse 4, says this, Let me dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Drew out, have we come full circle here? We started off, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. And now we're closing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And here it comes. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How does this closure pull everything together in your thinking? This is absolutely beautiful because it, it does dovetail, dovetail because one, you, you're you seeing this desire, let me dwell in thy house forever. And then here we see at the end, I will dwell in thy house forever. We're seeing a, a total confidence in the psalm being presented here. And it is just absolutely beautiful to see the desire and the promise are side by side. It will be accomplished. It is a promise of God, but there's the desire that that's there too. There's no desire apart from the desire for which God gave the new heart to the psalmist that doesn't tie in to what God promises. So we're seeing two things here, which is beautiful. There's the desire to dwell in the house of the Lord, to be in the house of the Lord. And we know that not only to be in the house means just to be in the vicinity or be up in heaven, but to be in the presence of the Lord with which you desire him most. All the other things pass away, and we see that there's the desire and the promise side by side, just shining brightly as a light to all us who believe. Now, Kat, we... We've been through this beautiful text, and what a psalm it is. Would you give us your final thoughts on this psalm, and would you close our discussion session with a prayer? Amen. It is a beautiful psalm, and everyone, I would hope that we would we'd take to this. This would give us the peace. The Lord is our shepherd, and we hear his voice, and we follow him. And he he leads us. He leads us where wherever we need to go. He chastens us. He he brings us in the right path. He keeps us and and he sustains us. And and we we will follow him and to the very end we will persevere with him. And he will lead us beside still waters and through the valley of the shadow of death. We we all face this, but Praise the Lord, we are going to be with him one day, and we his countenance will shine upon us, and we will we will have the joy forever in our hearts. It won't be like when when you know I feel bad and all this. We were we're gonna have our new bodies, our new life. We're gonna be with him, with our creator whom we love. And we know that not everyone loves the Lord, but we pray that they would come to to know him. And and this beautiful psalm, it just it just touches our hearts. And I'm going to say a prayer for us right now. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your word, which is truth. We thank you for the boot crew. We thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for the life you've given us and the chance to honor you in our life and everything we do and everything we say. We pray that it will be an honoring to you. We pray that you'll take this psalm, this psalm to our heart. And, and we know you're our great shepherd. And Lord, we, we trust and we count on you. Just lead us and guide us, Lord, and, and keep us in our hearts in the right way in the boot crew. And, and we pray that someone might be touched in their life and that they may know the great shepherd as we know him. He is the, he is the greatest general shepherd that we could ever know. He leads and guides us. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. We love you, we honor you, and we just mostly thank you and praise you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.